Good morning, everyone. So good to see you and to be back with you. Take your Bibles, uh, open up to the book of Daniel, chapter 6. Daniel, chapter 6. If you're using a Bible in a seat around you, it's on page 788. If you need a Bible, please take one. That's our gift to you. Just as you're opening up to the book of Daniel, just a quick reminder about our uh, a block party coming up this Saturday is one of our feature events in a year where we try to serve the world around us, build bridges with the community around us so we can ultimately point them to Jesus. And uh, so there's two things that I need you to do for block party this coming Saturday. Number one, invite people. Invite your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, people that your kids play soccer with, whatever. Invite people to come and be part of this day uh, together as a church. There's some postcards out at the information center. You can uh, use those to hand out to some friends and family. And number two, we need about 20 more people to serve in all kinds of different ways. Some for a short period of time, some for a little bit longer. If you would love to serve at the block party next Saturday, please see Tammy at the information center after the service is done. All right, let me ask you this question. What do you do when people intentionally try to make your life difficult? What is your normal response when someone tries to make your life difficult? Now, let me clarify what I mean by that. I do not mean when you go through the drive through at McDonald's and the ice cream machine is broken down that they are trying to make your life difficult. That is not what I mean. All right, what I mean is someone who does things intentionally just to make life hard for you. And many times they do it so that they can get ahead at your expense. Well, today we're going to look at the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And just a reminder, uh, if you're new with us today, this summer we are journeying through the scriptures and looking at a number of different Bible stories uh, that are kind of hallmark important Bible stories in Scripture. And uh, as we look at these stories, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched a cartoon movie as a kid and then watched it as an adult. Like, as a kid, you're like, oh, that's so cool. And then as an adult, you watch it again, you go, oh, I didn't see that before in the cartoon. Like, Shrek was that way for me. And, uh, and so that's what we're talking about. Sometimes if we grew up in church, we learn these stories we learn them in such a way that we have this kind of lens that we see them through as kids, but when we become adults, we kind of see them in a different perspective. And so I wanted to maybe read the story of Daniel to you today from a kid's Bible, because this might remind you of how you learned the story of Daniel in the lion's den. So I asked Neil Moody, our children's ministry director, to give me a, a kid's Bible that I could read this story to you from. It's story time with Kirk. Uh, the first time that he, uh, the first book that he gave me, the first uh, uh, kid's Bible he gave me, the story was called, uh, what was it called? It was called Daniel for Dinner. And I thought, I'm not going to read about Daniel for dinner. That doesn't seem appropriate in church. Uh, so we are going to read this story. Just listen along. God bless Daniel. He made Daniel very wise. The king planned to make Daniel ruler of all the land. Now the other wise men were jealous. They tried to find something bad about Daniel. But Daniel was a good man. He always prayed to God. He always obeyed God. The men could not find anything bad, so they made a plan. They went to the king. Let's make a new law, they said. Let's say that everyone has to pray to you. And if they don't, we'll throw them into the lion's den. Well, that sounded good to the king, so he made it a new law. Daniel heard about the new law, but he went to his room and he prayed anyway. Now the men knew Daniel would pray. They saw him and took him to the king. Let's throw Daniel into the lion's den, they said. The king was sorry because he liked Daniel, but he could not change his law. The men's plan had worked. They threw Daniel to the lion's. And the next morning, the king got up early. He ran to the lion's den. Daniel, did God save you, he called. Yes, king, said Daniel. God sent an angel to close the lion's mouths. The king was happy. He took Daniel out. God had saved him. And they all lived happily ever after. That is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. You know, when I learned the story of Daniel in the lion's den, it was always like with pictures like these, where the lions always look so happy. 
so cheerful. And I don't understand why they were so happy and so content. They had gone a whole day without eating anything. They were hangry, probably. But there they are, sitting there with nice big grins on their faces and Daniel cozying up to them. And that's how we always imagined the story of Daniel and the lion's den to be. But I think we've been sold a bill of goods on the lions being this kind of happy-go-lucky group of animals. Look what the animals, what the lions were really like. Look at verse 24 of Daniel chapter 6. So this is after Daniel has been rescued. And this is what the lions are really like. The king then gave the command, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den. They, their children, and their wives... They had not even reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. That's what the lions were really like. They were hungry. They were bloodthirsty. They couldn't wait to pounce on something. And I I am almost positive that there is no chance that Daniel was the first meal that was about to be served up to these lions. I'm sure that as Daniel would have looked into the lion's den for the very first time, there may have been some blood splattered, there may have been some bones scattered all over the place, and that's what he would have been under threat against. There was a group of people who wanted to bring a very real end to Daniel. Like it is a whole new level of trying to cancel someone that's going on here. So what do you do when people intentionally try to make your life difficult, like what Daniel experienced? Do do you just push back harder against them? Do you try to take control of the situation for yourself? Do you run to work or hobbies or alcohol or food or porn to bring you comfort? Do you just run and hide somewhere? Well, Daniel shows a different way of approaching this kind of a situation. Daniel simply chooses to trust God. He chooses to trust God. How in the world does someone trust God in this kind of a moment? How how do you trust God? Because the story of Daniel is really a story of his co-workers being jealous towards him and the success that he was having. And they wanted to bring an end to him. That's really what the story of Daniel is about. How do you trust God when people that you work with day in and day out want to make your life miserable? How do you trust God when someone wants to get you fired? How do you trust God if your marriage is falling apart and it feels like the other person is doing things intentionally to hurt you? How do you Trust God when people in your family or your neighborhood are making your life hard? How how do you trust God when it seems like there are people out in the world who are making millions of dollars while you're trying just to be able to scrounge up a few pennies to put food on the table? How, How do you trust God? How in the world does Daniel get to this place where he trusts God in this kind of an environment. If you were a kid in church, you may have learned this song. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm and dare to make it known. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. And we've lifted up Daniel as being some great superhero who made some great choices to be able to trust God in this incredible act of courage. But you need to know, as we've seen throughout this entire series, Daniel is not the hero of this story. God is the hero of the story. And what the story of Daniel teaches us is this. It is worth trusting your entire life to the king with a kingdom that never ends. See, Daniel makes his decisions not because he has any level of boldness, but because he has complete confidence in who God is. When King Darius sees what happens to Daniel, look what he says about God in verse 26 and 27. Darius says, I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. 
for he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. For he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Darius finally has this moment of clarity of exactly who God is. But for Daniel, this was not news. He already had very clear understanding in his heart and his mind of who God is. He already knew that God was the living God who endures forever. He already knew that God is the one whose kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion will have no end. Daniel was a guy who once lived in, in, in Israel and now he has been moved to live in Babylon. But no matter which kingdom he's living in, Israel or Babylon, he sits there and goes, God is still king over it all. And I have complete confidence in that. Think about all the nations and the rulers that have come and gone in the history of this world. If you're getting worked up about the political climate right now and you're worried about what's going to happen to the entire world in the political climate we find ourselves in, let me tell you something. Everybody who thinks they're powerful, there had been a long list before them who thought they were just as powerful and God is the only one who's still standing. His kingdom knows no end. He rescues and he delivers. Daniel knew that. And he is the God who performs miracles. Daniel's secret to trusting is that he just simply trusted in the one whose kingdom doesn't end. More than he trusted anyone or anything else. Your view of God is going to directly influence your desire and your ability to trust God. If you think God is a tyrant and he's cruel... It's going to influence the way that you view him and your desire to trust him. If you think God is weak and distant, it's going to influence your desire to trust him when you are hitting the hard things of life. If, if God is only words in a book that we talk about that's thousands of years old, that's going to influence the way you relate to him today because you're going to think he has no relevance to today. But what if, what if God is really the same yesterday, today, and forever? What if the God that you read about in this book and the stories you read about in this book and how he relates with humanity, what if he is really the same God today? If you see God for who he really is, that he is the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise one who is holy and loving and who lives, and he is the king of a kingdom that never ends, does it not make sense to just trust him? I mean, we trust people who have far less knowledge or skill or strength than God does every day. Why wouldn't we trust him? And the good news is that what Daniel knew to be true is something that's available for every single one of us today. We can have the same kind of confidence. That statement that Darius makes about God's kingdom having no end, it ultimately points us to Jesus. I'm going to put a verse up on the screen from the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. The scriptures say this, talking about, uh, uh, about God's kingdom. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He, Jesus, will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Now, I know that if you're not used to this kind of language, it might sound like some really weird movie plot that's going on right now. So let me just describe this a little bit to you. The Bible describes that there are two different kingdoms that exist. There is the kingdom of darkness, and there is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of darkness is a reality where everyone and everything in it lives in rebellion against God. It is a place where every single human begins their life. We all begin in the kingdom of darkness. In the kingdom of darkness, 
We live in a space where we do what we want, when we want, how we want, because ultimately what we have believed is I am responsible for making myself happy. And at the core of it, we live in a space of going, I don't really need God. And Jesus says, the devil is the ruler of this world. He is the ruler of the kingdom of darkness. And the devil has been given authority over people and structures and systems of this world. The kingdom of darkness is ultimately built on lies. It has good things in it. There are things that, that are appealing and attractive to it, but it is ultimately a bunch of lies that are ready to crumble. It is a place of spiritual slavery. It's a place that ultimately ends in death. The kingdom of God is a place where the sovereign, the rule of a sovereign and good God who governs over all things. The kingdom of God is where people willingly submit to Jesus as king. It's where what God wants done is done. It's a kingdom that is here. God does reign over all. But it is a kingdom that is not yet fully experienced until Jesus returns. And in God's kingdom, not only is Jesus king, but he is a king who is generous and gracious and loving, who cares. His immediate presence is available to all who call on him. It is a kingdom of life. It is a kingdom of hope. It is a personal kingdom of God with us. And you've heard us talk many times about how Jesus provides forgiveness of sin through his death on the cross. And that is 100% absolutely true and essential for us to know. But Jesus did not only come to provide forgiveness for your sins. Jesus came to rescue you from the kingdom of darkness and bring you into the kingdom of God. That's what it tells us in the book of Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to put this verse on the screen. It says this, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Salvation is both the forgiveness of your sins and the transferring of you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Let me try and put it this way. This is a weak example, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you're a fan of the NFL, of football, let's say that you were born to play for the Dallas Cowboys. All right? You're going to have some good moments, but you ultimately know it's going to end in disaster. <laughs> and, and, and then along comes someone else who everybody knows this team is going to win the Super Bowl this year and every year. And that team says, we want you, to, we're going to rescue you from the Dallas Cowboys and we're going to bring you to play for our team. I, I know it's a weak example, but just to give you an idea, uh, that comparison doesn't even do justice to how great of a gift it is to be rescued from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. And the good news is that the kingdom of God is open to everyone through Jesus. It is not a special club that is only available to those who are smart enough or religious enough. If you live in a reality where you experience a life of being rejected and unacceptable, the kingdom of God is open to you. If you feel weak and powerless, the kingdom of God is open to you. No matter what race you are, how much education you have, what your IQ is, how much money you have or don't have in your bank account, the kingdom of God is open to you through faith in Jesus Christ. Every single one of us has faith in something or someone how do I know that? Because we all have something that's guiding our life choices and decisions, even if it's yourself. We all have faith in something or someone. But every other person or program or book 
or podcaster that you trust your life to. It is all temporary. It will never, ever last. Only God and his kingdom lasts forever. And he came to rescue you from the kingdom of darkness and make you part of his kingdom. And he says the only way that that happens is by you putting your faith in Jesus. Not by all of your works or how impressive you can be with your life. Put your faith in Jesus. And God, through his grace, does the miracle of moving you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Now, once you've been redeemed to the kingdom of God, the Bible says that you become a citizen of this kingdom. If you're a Christian, you are first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of God. Yes, you're a citizen of Canada, but that's a secondary citizenship. You live as citizens of God's kingdom. And one of the things that I've learned in my own Christian life is this. Trusting God for my salvation is one thing. But the Christian life is a journey of learning to trust God over and over and over and over again. I learn to trust God and I have faith in God for my salvation. But I learn to trust God for every moment of my life. I don't know about you. Maybe you're someone who has figured it all out and what it looks like to trust God. But trusting God is what the Christian life is all about. It's what it means to be a citizen of God's kingdom. And to some people, trusting God sounds very scary. Because what if God doesn't come through the way that I want God to come through? What if I get hurt in the process? If you read the story of Daniel... Daniel never indicates that he knows what the end result is going to be when he gets thrown in the lion's den. He doesn't know if he's going to live to see another day or not. But he simply trusts God. To other people, trusting God sounds something very passive and weak to do. Like, what do you mean trust God? Just take control of the situation and live it out. But it's not weak at all. It's a commitment to live every day in every situation with this mindset. I'm a citizen of God's kingdom. He's God and I'm not. He knows more than I know. He's more powerful than I am. And he's good. So it's not that I do nothing when I trust God. It's that I will live as a citizen of the kingdom of God and do everything his way. That's what it means to trust God. The entire Christian life has far more hope and far more peace and far more purpose to it when you trust Jesus to be king. And I don't just mean this as a theoretical statement of trusting Jesus. Like, oh, I trust God. I hear people kind of flippantly say it sometimes. Like, oh, yeah, I trust God. I mean real world, boots on the ground, Living as someone who trusts the king to be who he says he is. He is faithful and he is good and he is holy and he is righteous and he is just. And that's how Daniel lived his life. Not just in the crisis of the lion's den. It's how he lived his whole life. Who you live for on the good and the normal days of life is who you're going to live for when, when someone makes your life difficult. If your goal in the good days is, I'm just going to do whatever makes me happy, guess what you're training yourself to do when the crisis hits? I'm going to live for whatever makes me happy. If you keep trusting God on the good days, guess what's going to come more naturally to you when life gets hard? So what does it really look like to trust God? Well, quickly, three things in the story of Daniel, what it looks like to trust God. First of all, trusting God means living God's way. It just means living God's way. Just imagine, put yourself in Daniel's shoes. Another nation comes, conquers where you live, makes you move to their land instead, about 1,200 kilometers away from your home. And you're going to spend at least the next seven decades being forced to live in another land under someone else's rules and laws. They are not immigrants who chose to move. They were forced to move. 
Put yourself in his shoes and imagine the emotional toll. Being away from your family, all that you know in your life, your friends, your home. And then look what verse 3 says about Daniel in chapter 6. It says, Daniel distinguished himself because he had an extraordinary spirit. Here's what that means. Daniel was just committed to staying pure before God. He, he was ethical. He was hardworking. He was trustworthy. He lived with integrity. In short, he, he was committed to doing life God's way. And by being committed to doing life God's way, it made him stand out compared to everybody else. If you want to be radical in this world, do life God's way. You will stand out compared to everyone else. Like, you heard Robin up here talking about serving uh, with a bunch of kids on Monday nights. Who in their right mind gives up every week on a Monday night to come and hang out and serve with all these kids? Right? People who love Jesus and see Jesus as king. That's who. That's who goes and does, does these kinds of things. One of the things we got to understand is that trust and obedience are very much linked to each other. When you disobey God, what you're saying is, there is a better way than God's way. That we trust ourselves more than we trust God. When you do life God's way, you're saying, God, I trust you to be right. I trust you that this is the path that I'm supposed to go down to find life. And to be the most loving person possible. Do not let your circumstances define your way of life. Let God define your way of life. That's what a lifestyle of trust in God looks like. Think about your money and your marriage and your sexuality and your time. Your sense of purpose and relationships in life. Are you doing it God's way? When we pray, God's kingdom come and your will be done... It means that we want every part of our hearts and lives to be surrendered to God, that we trust God with every part of it. We do things his way. In order to do that, though, you have to know what it actually means to live God's way, which is why you need to be reading your Bible. You need to stay in the Bible and keep learning what God's ways are. And even if you've been a Christian your entire life, you need to keep reading your Bible because God will still speak to you and show you what his ways are for your life. Don't ever think that you already know everything that the Bible says about God's ways for your life. Last week I was doing my devotions and I'm reading it and like all of a sudden something jumped out at me in God's word that just taught me like, oh man, I had never seen this as being a sin before. I need to think differently and start to live differently in response to this because I want to do life God's way. Get into your Bible. The second thing of what it means to trust God, trusting God means choosing connection with him over comfort. Prayer is one of the most significant ways to express trusting in God. Because prayer is where you will acknowledge that you need God more than anything else. Look at verse 10 and see how Daniel responds to this new law. The Bible says that this new law comes into effect and Here's what he does. He goes home, and three times a day, he just keeps praying, just like he had done before. He doesn't fight against those who set him up with this new law. He doesn't appear to get angry or anxious. He just goes home and prays. See, the, the comfortable thing for some people is push back. For other people, the comfortable thing would have been just to maybe double down on your work and kind of just maybe stop praying for a little while. I mean, it's only a month. You can get by without, for a month without praying. It's fine. That's what the law was calling for. He doesn't get angry or anxious about the whole thing. He doesn't look for comfort. He looks to connect with his God. He just kept doing what he always did. He valued his connection and relationship with God so much that it did not really bother him the risk that was involved. He trusted God to be his source of everything that he would need. And most of us don't face the threat of losing our lives if we pray. 
But we are faced every day with choosing comfort over connection with God. Think about this past week. How was your connection with God over this past week? I don't have time to pray and talk to God today because, well, I was too busy playing my PS5. Or I was too busy binge watching this show on Netflix. Or I had a whole bunch of business deals that I had to strike this week, so I just didn't have time to really connect with God. I'm under so much stress, I just need to escape in some way to something that's going to make me feel better. I don't have time to connect with God. There are just so many more comfortable ways to spend a Sunday morning than to get up and go to church and worship Jesus with God's people. I don't really have time for it. Think about someone that you respect and admire in life. It could be a business leader, it could be a podcaster, whoever, just somebody, maybe somebody you don't even know, but like, you just admire their leadership, you admire their wisdom, their perspective on life. Now imagine that they invited you to come into their home to offer you their wisdom and to share their resources with you. What would you do? You would clear your calendar in a heartbeat to be there. The God of the universe has invited you to come. Make connection with him your priority. That will declare a sense of trusting him. You trust that other person. You trust their ability to help you. Imagine how different our lives would be if we really trusted that staying connected with God was literally the best thing that we could ever do. Remember who God is. You have problems? Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. You need wisdom? Come to him and ask for it, and he promises to give it to you generously. You're overwhelmed by life right now? He says, come to me, all who are weary, and I'll give you rest. The truth is, staying connected with God is actually where you receive the greatest comfort. We we go looking for comfort in all these other places, but the greatest comfort you will find is by staying connected with God. Which leads to the last thing we can learn from Daniel. Trusting God means that you can have confidence in God's protection. I believe wholeheartedly in God's protection. I know that many of you have stories of how God has protected you in different ways. If you've, I've almost drowned three times in my life. I believe in God's protection. I'm standing here today in part because of God's protection. If you've ever driven with me on the 401, you would believe in God's protection too. But I also, I know this, there are a lot of people who struggle with the idea of God's protection. Because frankly, you see a lot of heartache going on around you. Maybe you're walking through the hardship yourself and you're going like, where is God in all of this? Where is God's protection when I feel like I need it? Like, it's nice to read a story about God rescuing a guy from the lion's den, but really, God hasn't shown up and rescued me from my problems. What makes Daniel so special and not me? Maybe you're wrestling with the idea where you're going, like, maybe I'm just not good enough. Maybe I'm just not as spiritual as Daniel was. You know, Daniel tells us why God shut the mouths of the lions. And it wasn't because Daniel was so great. Look at verse 22. Verse 22, it tells us, Daniel tells us, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. They haven't harmed me, for I was found innocent before him. Now some of you are going to think immediately, there it is. I just have to try harder to be better and God will protect me. Some of you are going to think, I am so bad, I could never be innocent before God. But I want to tell you a better story today. Every single human is guilty before God. We all start guilty before God. You cannot avoid being guilty. You are condemned and destined for judgment as a human. But God is also merciful and gracious 
And Jesus is God's answer to the human predicament. And 2,000 years ago, on a cruel cross, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and died in your place. He took the punishment that you deserve. And for those who place their faith in Jesus, the Bible uses a word called justification. You know what justification means? It's a legal declaration. And it means this. You are no longer guilty. In fact, not only are you no longer guilty, you are now innocent in the eyes of God. When you place your faith in Jesus, you are innocent in the eyes of God. When God looks down and he sees Daniel, the reason that God rescues Daniel is because God saw Daniel as being innocent. And the same promise holds true for you today. You can count on the same protection on your life from Almighty God. If you have put your faith in Jesus, if you are in Christ, you can count on the same protection because when God sees you through Christ, you are innocent. Now, that does not mean life will be without hardships. What it does mean is Jesus always gets the final say. And because he rose from the dead and conquered death, he is king who is living and victorious and has promised to give you his life forever. That's the good news of the gospel. That's why the story of Daniel is still real for us today. I want to ask you just to close your eyes. I don't know where you're feeling like life is difficult. But I do know this. In this room and online, you are not alone. For some of you, your life is pretty good right now, and you're not going through hardships where other people are making your life hard. And so I'm going to ask you, if your life is good right now, just take some time to begin to pray right now for the people around you or people in your life who are going through it. If you are in this place today and you are hurting because other people are doing things to hurt you, and you're wrestling with this idea, I want to invite you just in your own heart and mind right now just to be able to say, God, I trust you. And then say, God, help me trust you. I trust you, God. Help me trust you every day. Some of you are feeling very stuck and you don't know how to really trust God because the circumstances are just so heavy and so big and so overwhelming. And I just want to say it's so important for you to get connected with some other people and want to invite you to connect into our Freedom Session ministry starting in just a few weeks where you can learn how to trust God even in the pain of your life. Friends, listen. It is worth trusting your entire life to a king with a kingdom that never ends. Daniel's story can be your story. Not because you're great or Daniel was great, but because our God never changes. And he is great. And he is gracious towards you. Father, I pray that you would help us to see you in the moments where we are feeling overwhelmed by the fire. Rescue us, God, through your great power. In Jesus' name, amen.